Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service this morning. And also, I want to welcome um, everyone who are joining us through Facebook live streaming right now. Uh, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to worship together this morning. So last week, we had a wonderful week at church with Vacation Bible School, welcoming two, over 250 kids and 100 dedicated volunteers. It's awesome, right? Yeah, um, so we are so grateful for all the hands that help with VBS and above all God's grace. So today, we are so blessed to have a wonderful kids here. Um, so I believe that um, the, this worship service will have any update, like new, uh, new phone numbers, new email address. Um, please fill out the connect card as well. And next Sunday, we will have a Patriot service, all of three services here, um, honoring all of our armed forces formation travel opportunities next year right now and or you can reach out to Donna Pinkney or you pick up the flyer in the narthex after worship service so now Loving God, you have created us, redeemed us, and called us to be co-workers in your mission. Amen. Today our opening hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness, the number 140 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Please stand as you are able in your body or in your spirit. We continue to stand toward the cross. Let us reaffirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. taking a seat, let us greet each other with a sign of peace, saying, Peace be with you. Jerry Harris to read Psalm 4 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today I'll be reading Psalm 133 from the New International Version. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, if I can have all of my camp firelight fireflies up here for me, we can spread out up here on our chancel or on the floor. Find a spot. Come on. Oh, careful. It's okay. Find a spot. Awesome. All right, everybody. Make a spot up on stage. Hey, Ellis, get that a little bit more. Yeah. Spread the love. Spread the love. Scoot back, Haley. Can you get back there with Avery? Come on. Come on. Come on. I need my littles up front. So, Rhett, you stay here. Tell us, Barry, can we get up there? 
guys back to see with, sit with your parents, and we're going to come up for the children's sermon in just a second. All right, Benji, back with your Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful way to be in worship with God. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. And as our children taught us, we are always to put our trust in God. Even when we're afraid, we know that we can put our trust in God. And one of the ways that we do that is through prayer. So will you join me now as we go before God in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today in your name. God, we thank you for all of the incredible kids that came here for Vacation Bible School and for all of the helpers and teachers that helped our kids to understand the love that you have for them. God, we thank you that you are in the business of transformation. You never give up on us, even when we think that you should. And even more, you call us to work with you. As you transform us, we become part of the transformation of the world. God, we thank you for all those here at Wrightsville who have said yes to working with you, who give of their time and their talents to help us to grow in our faith. We thank you for Sunday school teachers, confirmation mentors, children's ministry helpers, 412 youth faith keepers, small group leaders, vacation Bible school helpers, and more. Jesus, you taught us that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So God, please continue to call people to this work and give them the courage to say yes. God, we pray especially now for anyone who might even now be hearing and feeling a stirring in their hearts. We pray for our community of Wrightsville Beach and Wilmington. God, let the scales fall from our eyes so we can see our town the way you see it. Help us celebrate what you celebrate and grieve what grieves you. Help us see the needs of others and give us imagination to see a different way forward instead of just keeping things the way they've always been. God, we pray for your world. Lord, in a world with so much fear, hate, and violence. Help us remember that we are citizens of the kingdom of God before we are citizens of a nation, and that we are called to be obedient to you above obedience to ideology. We pray today especially for Israel and Gaza that your peace would break through. And God, we pray for all those whose needs are especially close to our hearts today and we name them before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we thank you that you not only hear our prayers, but that you listen to them, and that you have proven time and time again that you are faithful and that we can put our trust in you. So God, trusting in your unfailing love, help us mean what we say as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This week we had over 250 kids at Vacation Bible School. And because of the continued generosity of our congregation, none of those children had to pay a single penny to participate and get to learn about God's love and the stories of scripture. As our ushers come forward, we, I'd like to remind you that these are the ministries that you are participating in and contributing to as you make a contribution to continue our ministry here. 
like to remind you that in addition to giving a gift using the offering plates, you can also always use the QR code that's found in your bulletin. And for everyone who's worshiping with us online, you can always use our website, wrightsvilleumc.org. Let us now continue to worship God. seated. All right, I'd like to invite everyone up for the children's sermon. Come on up. I want to be on the carpet. Fire Life Vacation Bible School this week, and some of us are just learning about it today. So, so for those of you who were here this week, you get to help me teach part of the children's sermon. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, everybody. So this week at Vacation Bible School, our theme was Camp Fire Life. So as you can see, I'm dressed like a camp counselor, or maybe I would just wear this every day anyway. 
And then we also have our awesome, we've got our trees and our kayaks and our tents and our awesome camp firelight. And, and Lou the lightning bug, he had to go help another group of campers, but he was also our mascot this week as we learned to trust God. That was a big thing we kept coming back to every day was how we can always trust God. So repeat after me. Whenever I'm afraid, whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. That was our camp call out for the week. We said it every day and we always got to come back to it. And for those of you guys who either sang or heard, we actually just sang a whole song about it. So let's say it all together one more time. Ready? Whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. And speaking of trust, every day of Camp Firelight, we learned about a different way that we can put our trust in God. And if you know Miss Courtney, you know that I love to use some motions and some sign language to help us remember. So we're going to teach everybody here in the congregation our Firelight focus for each day and how we learned different ways we can put our trust in God. So everybody, including you out there, you're going to repeat after me. So trust God, your turn, trust, trust God. God to go with us. To go with us. Let's put that whole phrase together, trust God to go with us. Ready? Trust, trust God, God to, to go, go with us. us. And each one starts with the same trust God, so we know that part. Our day two was trust God to lead the way. So let's say that all together. Ready? Trust, trust God, God to lead, lead the way. way. Awesome. Day three, remember we know trust God to share wisdom. Let's put it all together. Ready? Trust God to share wisdom. And our day four starts with trust God to spark Joy. Let's put that all together. Ready? Trust God to spark joy. And these were things that we also got to learn more about in our various stations of VBS. So raise your hand if you would like to share with the congregation your favorite station of the week. Cameron. Art. So much fun. Wes, what about you? Art. Who has another one? Breck? Snack. Snack. Guys, can you believe that we continued to learn to trust God even in our snack? Snack was just not like, oh, here's some goldfish. They actually were tied into our lesson every day, which is pretty impressive. Jenny, what was your favorite station? Science. That was a crowd favorite. What about, I haven't heard a couple others. What about Stella? What was yours? Snack. Snack. What about? Okay. Okay. Story time. All right, there's two more stations I haven't heard yet. Ellis? Missions. Missions. And who can remember what were some of our organizations that we helped in missions, Ellis? We helped. We made like a snack pack and a breakfast pack for people that don't have that. Yes, yeah, so we made snack packs. We worked with communities and schools. And Miss Christina, what was the other one? Family and Family Promise. And there's still one that I think everybody loved. You had popsicles. You were outside. What was it? Yeah. So we had snack, and we had art, and we had story time. We had missions. We had science. We had rec. And we were learning to trust God through it all, which is really, really amazing. Raise your hand if you had an amazing time at Vacation Bible School. And raise your hand Double. if you want to go to Vacation Bible School next year. Double. Amazing. So let's put our hands down and let's share with the congregation our closing prayer. We ended our uh, closing assembly every day with this. So you guys can all bow your heads and repeat after us as well. All right. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. These friends. These friends. And for all living things. And for all living things. We love, we love you, and we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, Fireflies, you can either go back with your families or line up with Miss Christina in this bright pink dress at the door to go to Sunday school. Let's go. I'm just helping you right there. Is that not good?
Well, I want to thank uh, um, everybody that helped um, a absolutely leads together. It was, uh, it was a mighty team effort, but it was really, really well run. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience uh, for folks. So great job, everybody. Um, I do want to say something. I, I, it looks like a lot of the kids, of course, went to Sunday school. But if, if you're a kid, if you're a kid, if you're a small kid or a tall kid, it doesn't matter. But if you're a kid, I want to tell you something real quick. Um, you learn that whenever you're afraid to put your trust in God, right? Um, well, I'm, I'm a grown-up now, and I want to tell you that I still get afraid, and I still put my trust in God. In fact, the more grown-up I become, the more I put my trust in God. Um, so that's not something that you, you, you know, are suddenly going to become a grown-up and become independent, I realize that I need God more and more each day. And so I hope that you will continue, whenever you're afraid, to put your trust in Him. Now let's look at our scripture for today. It's uh, from Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. We're going to hear the story of the conversion of Paul. Of course, he originally went by the name of Saul. So we're going to see that in our scripture today. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven, get up and enter the city and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he's praying, and he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, he laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your word and ask, Lord, that you might speak to us anew. Lord, you are an awesome God. And we ask that your power might rest upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's set the scene. A brilliant light flashes. It strikes like lightning. Paul is shocked by a charge from heaven, and he is knocked from his horse. A voice speaks to Paul out of nowhere, and it holds his attention with a vice-like grip. Paul is converted. The persecutor becomes the preacher. The surprising element of this event is the realization that the conversion of Paul was the conversion of a person who was already very, very religious. Paul was the best of believers, the master of morality. He lived out every letter of the law, a superior student of the scriptures. He was a dedicated defender of the demands of the law, and yet he was converted. Now, for most of us, this fact kind of undermines the very foundation of our understanding of the concept of conversion. From the social point of view, we associate conversion with rogues, rascals, and reprobates. From the intellectual point of view, we think that conversion is what happens to 
unbelievers, agnostics, skeptics, and cynics. From the missionary point of view, we think that conversion is concerned with pagans, heathens, idol worshipers. Religious conversion in general is for the ungodly, the wicked, you know, sinners. But the conversion of Paul fits into none of these categories. Paul's conversion was conversion of an enthusiastic believer who was already totally committed to God. This is important. Paul's single ambition in life was to be a dedicated and obedient servant of God's holy law, and yet Paul was converted. Not to the dark side of the force, but to the light of the gospel. The explanation of this strange fact is that Paul's conversion is not a moral or ethical conversion. It is a theological conversion. It was a conversion from death under the law to life in the gospel. In order to more completely understand the theological dimensions of Paul's conversion, let's review the story from our text. A man whose name was Saul had dedicated his life to the persecution and actual killing of Christians in an all-out effort to destroy the early church. And this same man, who of course will later go by Paul, was on his way to Damascus in Syria, one of the oldest cities in the world. His heart is motivated by malice. His mind is dead set on murder. That common nobody who had the gall to make a thing from heaven. Now it's those around him saying, Saul, Saul, illness, with this guilt-induced question, who are you, Lord? And the amazing answer comes back, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, it's significant here that when our Lord identified himself to Paul, he used his earthly human name, Jesus. It's as if our Lord wanted it to be perfectly plain that the one who is speaking to Paul is the same baby born in Bethlehem, that child of the carpenter of Nazareth, that young man who was crucified on a cross in Jerusalem. Yes, it was the Jesus of the Galilee who had been raised and exalted by Paul's very own God who was speaking to him now. The tremendous truth and the stark reality of this experience that engulfed Paul like a tidal wave was that this conversion event would sweep away all the lies which had marked and motivated his life up until now. Jesus reprimanded and charged Paul with the full force of the law, and Paul was found judged and guilty. For all intents and purposes, Paul's experiencing a spiritual death on the way to Damascus. It's often said Paul's converted on the road to Damascus, and while that's certainly partially true, it's not the whole truth. You see, the truth is that his conversion just began on the road to Damascus. The conversion of Paul, like all true conversions, happened in multiple steps. The first act was dying to the life that he once lived. The second act was his being raised to a new life in Jesus. Paul is personally experiencing what he would later preach, that the law kills, but the Spirit brings life. In this first act, the sign of Paul's experience of death was his blindness. Our text says when his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So the irony of ironies is this boastful, proud conqueror for God who had set out to Damascus on this mission to go hunt down Christians and kill them in order to eradicate the early church, he's led into Damascus like a poor blind beggar. The second act of Paul's conversion occurred while he was in Damascus. It was time to take on this new life that God had in store for him. So Ananias, directed by God, placed his hand on Paul, and then he absolved him of all his sins. 
And we're talking about murder. Okay? He commanded him to no longer persecute Christians, and instead he commissioned Paul to go and preach about the living Lord, Jesus, the Christ. The Holy Spirit entered into Paul, the scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. He went and got baptized, he ate food with other Christian followers, and therefore, after being fully nourished and strengthened by food and by the Spirit of Christ, Paul immediately goes to the nearest synagogue and begins to preach that Jesus had been crucified and raised from the dead. Paul's converted by the grace of Jesus Christ. However, there's one more act that needs to be added to this drama of Paul's conversion. One more step we need to cover here this morning. It's this final act that points out what Paul's conversion really means to all of us today. This third act, this final step of Paul's conversion, was the conversion of the word that he had heard into the energetic life of faith that he would live. It's one thing to hear it, you got to go live it. You see, before his conversion, Paul was already an ardent student of the Word. That is, the Holy Scriptures we know as the Old Testament. Okay? It was this Word that was his driving force in life. Paul was energetic, enthusiastic, dedicated doer of the Word. Nothing wrong with this Word. This is the Word of God. But Paul was misusing and mis- misunderstanding the point of this Word. He understood it literally, but he didn't understand it spiritually. So God decided to get his attention another way. That ever happened to you? Happens to me all the time. My wife tells me to do something over and over and over again, and I kind of shrug it off, and then I go, I don't know, to the doctor, and he'll say, you know, to do something, or I might even hear it on TV, and I go, you know, I really ought to be doing that. And my wife just puts her hand in her hands and is just like, I've been telling you that for years. You know, is that just me? Am I the only one that hard-headed? Sometimes you just need to hear the right message from a second source that you trust. So God sent the Word made flesh in Jesus Christ to tell Paul to stop persecuting the Christians and instead to proclaim the message of God's grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul's conversion redirects his energy. It transforms his life. Both the old word and the new word had motivated Paul. The old word, Paul was misusing, or he wouldn't have been going around killing people, right? The new word spoke directly to Paul so that he wouldn't misunderstand. It led him to proclaim a new life of faith hope, and love. Now this third act of Paul's conversion, that's the one that we so desperately need. We all need the conversion of our conviction into actions. We need to convert our dedication into deeds. We need to let the power of the Word made flesh radiate through us into the energetic lives of faith that we are called to live. It's like harnessing the gravity pull of a giant waterfall that turns into hydroelectric power to turn on all these lights. You know, it's like harnessing the the sunlight of solar energy to warm our homes. The power's there. It's just got to be transformed. It needs to be converted from one form of power to another. The tragedy of our lives is that somewhere along the power line, the energy has... We're afraid what others might think of us. You know, we become blasé, which causes us never to do anything, right? Far too often we go through life anxiously looking in the rearview mirror to see if anybody's judging us, while all the while we're stuck in first gear and never moving into high. No danger here, just dullness. We're not letting the power of the Word of God convert into enthusiastic actions in our lives. Far too quickly, we short-circuit it into care.
convert it into energetic believers. And it robs us, not only of knowing the full joy of a dynamic faith, but also of experiencing a truly Christian style of life that we really want. For example, take, take words that we say all the time in church, like forgiveness, or love, or acts of service, okay? Th these are words that clearly characterize the will of God for our lives, right? Well, without enthusiasm, these actions never quite measure up to what the New Testament is talking about when it talks about these words. Forgiveness without enthusiasm? I mean, it becomes a duty that's just begrudgingly done. Love becomes just another law to be obeyed. Service becomes a dreaded demand, which we practice like some dull discipline, rather than it being the deed that we're delighted to do. Without enthusiasm, God's will becomes a series of tasks that we just check off. We actually exhaust ourselves trying to do it all. In reality, these are things we could be doing joyfully because we're plugged into this powerhouse of unlimited energy which constantly flows through us. Now, before this sermon ends, let there be no conclusions drawn today that this sermon is some sort of you should, you must kind of sermon, okay? I do those all the time. I don't apologize for them, but this is not one of those sermons, okay? All right? The intention of this sermon is to place no demands upon you as a listener whatsoever, okay? The intent of this sermon is to confront you with a you will message, okay? The theme of this sermon is not a demand. It is a declaration. It is a promise from God, that he will not rest until the current is restored to our lives and until his word flows through us and moves us to expressive actions of faith. In our text, Paul did not go to Damascus looking to be converted. In fact, just the opposite, right? Our text is not about what Paul did. Rather, it's about what God did to Paul. God is the primary actor in the story of salvation. God it writes and directs and produces and stars in this story of conversion. It's God who knocked Paul off his horse to the ground. It is God who blinded Paul with the judgmental word. It was God who restores Paul's sight with a gift from the gospel. It's God who forgave. It is God who blessed. It is God who commissioned Paul. It's God at work in this story. And God is determined to do the same thing with you and with me. God will strike us again and again and again with his gracious word until that word makes contact and be finally becomes active in our lives. The word of God is like lightning doesn't strike when we want it to. Mm -mm. We cannot, by any power of our own, cause lightning to occur. Lightning strikes when the conditions are right. And so it is with the Word of God. In God's good time, we will experience the striking surge of the power of the Word in our lives. And then we'll express our faith in action. So look around you. No one's doing that. Look around you. <laughs> Look up. Go outside. Back out there in the heat. Look around. The clouds are gathering. The wind is changing. There's that refreshing scent in the air. The heavens are charged with power. In any moment now, there's going to be a bolt from the blue, and our lives will be radically changed. The word of God that we hear will be an electrified force of new energy in our lives so that we will live differently. Watch out. The word of God is close. It might strike any minute. Go forth in peace. 
name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, we want this experience. We want change in our lives. We want more direction. We want you to show us what you want us to do. Lord, help us to be ready when that lightning strike comes. Help us to be ready to be converted. Even as good religious people, help us to be ready for that change so that we might go forth with your power to serve just like Paul did. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. Well, our closing hymn today is uh, one of my favorites in the whole book. It's uh, hymn number 593. Um, I think we'll just sing the first verse, okay, of hymn number 593, Here I Am, Lord. Let's stand and sing it together. surge through you into the lives that God has called us to live. Go forth ready to receive the word and message from God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll clap their hands and all the trees of the